Hello and welcome to another Piper Pod. Today we're going to continue with the pharmacological theme and we're going to look at something that doesn't often get looked at, especially in our line of work, and that is the difference with medication administration and medication effects across the lifespan. So being in the military, we have a very specific clientele and that involves just looking after adults. So no pediatrics, no geriatrics, just just adults. And it makes it very easy to get used to uh, the simplicity, if you will, of medication administration and the adherence, uh, compliance levels, all that sort of stuff that uh, people who work in the general population or pediatrics or specialize with pediatrics, sorry, or geriatrics have to deal with. So I think it's important that we cover these differences because if we go on humanitarian aid or if we choose to work in a, a hospital which sees the greater population, then it's our duty to be up to date with the complexity that is essentially two different species really from the adult uh, in the way that the medications affect their body. So the lesson will focus on the pediatric and the geriatric side of the house. Before we continue on, we'll just have a little bit of revision. Uh, now the revision is on things that we covered off in the first lesson to do with pharmacology. So the fundamentals of pharmacology. So if we remember back then, the pharmacokinetics is dealing with what the body does to the drugs. So the changes that the body makes to the drug in order to allow absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So they're the components that we look at when we're looking at the pharmacokinetics. Now the pharmacodynamics is all about what the drug does to the body. So the physiological effects, the adverse effects, uh, the drug interaction, is all comes down to the pharmacodynamics of the actual medication. Now when we're looking at the two groups that we're looking at, the elder, elderly and the pediatrics, we need to understand that unlike adults, um, there is not a lot of studies that are out there backing it up. Now the main reasons for that is a lot of uh, organizations or a lot of pharmaceutical companies do not want to do large studies on the elderly because of the variables that exist within the elderly. They have a huge amount of comorbidities, they're generally on a lot of medications, they have a lot of uh, age-related or pre-existing diseases. So it's very difficult to remove variables in order to get good data associated with that medication. And PEDS, well, no one wants to study drugs on pediatrics. Okay? It's, uh, it's very hard to pass uh, the ethics community where we say that we're going to give a child who needs medication a placebo it usually is very hard to sell. So there's not a lot of studies out there. So a lot of the information that comes from medication to do with these two groups has a lot to do with people passing on adverse effects and learning by mistakes, unfortunately, or learning by the best method in which to administer certain medications. So just keep that in mind when we talk about these particular classes because there's not a lot of evidence out there that supports pharmaceutical use in these two groups. Now starting off looking at the pharmacokinetics of the elderly and pediatrics we're going to start with differences in their bodies uh, to do with absorption. So if you're giving an oral medication, obviously oral medication is the main way to give meds and it's subject to what's known as first pass metabolism and it's evolved in passing through the stomach, maybe being broken down a little bit and then usually being absorbed by the small intestine straight to the liver for first pass metabolism. Now in both classes uh, there's a reduction in gastric acidity which means that a lot of the times drugs that focus on the acidity levels in the in the body uh, to break down the drug before it gets to the small intestine you're going to have a delay in the absorption rate. Things that are enteric coated can get to the small intestine and not actually be broken down in order to be released uh, in, into the body. So what ends up happening is you have a very a prolonged and reduced level of drug that is actually released to the body and that obviously changes the, well, the half-life and the distribution rate. 
On top of that, we have the elderly has extremely slowed peristalsis and a reduction in gastric emptying, which means a lot of drugs will actually sit in the stomach and not move through with peristalsis as readily. So a lot of the times the drug can be either delayed in its release or it can be destroyed by the gastric contents for sitting in there too long. So just things to do with oral absorption. Now when we look at uh, intramuscular or subcut, uh, both classes have poor peripheral perfusion. Now that is purely got to do with the disproportionately small amount of muscle mass that is found in the elderly and in the very young. So if you give an IM injection, it has very poor circulation to those areas and very poor uh, mass of muscle, which means the absorption is reduced all around. So if you have a, a reduction in absorption of IM injections through the muscles, then you're going to end up with, a, again, a, de, a reduced and delayed onset of the drug. Now, topical medications are different within both classes. So the elderly generally have a very thin um, skin layer, which means absorption is far more rapid than you'll find in the adult class and children have a disproportionately large surface area of skin. So the surface area to volume ratio in children is way larger than it is with adults. So if you were to rub topical medication on a child, there is a huge risk of overdose or toxicity because of the disproportionately large surface area. So it's something to take into account. If you are giving topical medication to children, you use significantly less than you do with an adult as far as covering of, of surface area. Now IV is the preferred method of a drug, especially for pediatrics. Uh, it's more controllable. It has 100% bioavailability, so it's titratable uh, for size and everything else. However, because of the unpredictability associated with the lack of studies, there needs to be caution when giving it IV because it is going straight to the receptor sites and it's only subject to the distribution side of the house. Absorption is straight away. Okay, speaking of distribution, looking at pharmacokinetics, changes in the elderly and the pediatrics uh, with distribution also have a massive effect on the actual medication. Now, the first one has got to do with the low level of plasma proteins. Okay, so if you have a low level of plasma proteins like albumin, then the drugs associated with protein binding is going to be decreased. Now, if you remember in the first lesson, the beautiful thing about protein binding medication is you have that prolonged controlled effect of the drugs where the concentration gradient between the inactive and the active uh, medication is controlled by gradient shifts. So you'll get a percentage of the drug being active and not binded to the protein. And as that is metabolized and used, the medication that is protein bound will release from the protein and therefore be able to be utilized. So it has a lasting and controlled effect. If you have a reduction in the number of plasma proteins, then you are going to have a shortened half-life, so you'll burn through a lot more, and also you'll have an increased effect because you'll have more active medication molecules compared to plasma protein bounded inactive medication molecules. So that is a big thing. Now, the children have lower levels of plasma proteins because of the underdeveloped liver. So this is only associated with infancy. So usually by the age of four or five, the liver is fully functional and then their protein levels become quite normal. But before that, before the age of four or five, it's reduced because of an underdeveloped liver who's producing these proteins. Now in the elderly, their liver size is reduced. The functionality is generally uh, worsened, so they're not producing as much plasma proteins, so it has an overall decrease. Now, specifically looking at neonates in infancy, now for those that aren't up to date, a neonate means a child that is less than 28 days old. And infancy is anything up to four or five. So neonates in infancy have a higher, significantly higher percentage of body fluid than the adults. So if there's any medication out there that is uh, water-soluble, 
then it's going to have a much larger effect on the neonates. So what ends up happening is you'll actually have to end up giving significantly more medication, water-soluble medication to the child than you would an adult. Now a classic one for this is something like amoxicillin. So the IV dose for amoxicillin for children is 25 to 50 milligrams per kilo. Whereas the IV dose for adults is one gram. So your average 70 kilo adult gets around 14 milligrams per kilo. So significantly less. Now the reason for this has got to do with the water solubility of amoxicillin. So what ends up happening is this disproportionately larger percentage of body fluid will actually absorb a larger amount of the amoxicillin giving less amoxicillin to the actual receptor sites where it needs to work. So you need a higher concentration in order to have the same effect on the receptor sites within the body. Now the opposite is true for the elderly. The elderly have a lower percentage of body fluids compared to adults and obviously children. So therefore their doses need to be smaller if they're water soluble because if you give them a normal adult dose they're going to get a larger effect and a higher probability of adverse effects because of the reduction in water to pick up the solubility so the less water in the body you're not going to dilute it as much more water in the body the actual medication is going to be more diluted so the same concentration isn't going to go as far is probably the easiest way to put it now this is also true for uh, body fat. So if you have fat soluble medication, then body fat percentage is gonna have the same effect. Now, relatively speaking, children and elderly have an increase in body fat to muscle ratio than adults. Now obviously there's certain adults where this is not the case and they're subject to the same problems as the elderly or the pediatrics, but even your skinny uh, geriatrics still have a disproportionately larger body fat to muscle ratio. So if you give them a medication that is fat soluble, then like the water, the larger percentage of fat is gonna dilute that medication further, leaving less for the receptor sites themselves. Moving on to metabolism and excretion we obviously have some differences there as well. So looking at metabolism, the pediatric side of the house is absolutely insane. And I am not envious at all of pediatricians or nurses that choose to work in pediatrics because whoever said that children were small adults was absolutely full of shit, okay? Pediatrics are completely different humans. Now, the problem with pediatrics that you'll find is it goes from everyone from right from birth all the way up to the age of 18. Now obviously that means that pediatrics have a massive spread which makes medication administration very difficult. And we'll delve into that a little bit further later on. As far as problems to do with metabolism is when you're dealing with the really young, usually up to your three years old, you have a very slow hepatic clearance of medication. So all medications that have liver-based metabolism will have a much longer half-life. So their effects will be greater, which means re-administration of the drug needs to be taken into account and is different than adults because if you give a dose when they're already at high serum levels or higher than half-life, then you are going to increase the levels within the body, increase the likelihood of adverse effects and toxicity. Now, when they get to the age of anywhere between three and six, due to their heightened development, their metabolism increases exponentially. So that is much higher than an adult. So that actually reduces the half-life of a lot of drugs, which means their effects are grossly reduced. The problem is, is there's no real way to know when they've hit this heightened metabolism rate, or do they still have slow hepatic clearance without actually doing levels? And then to make it even more difficult, is not all pediatrics are created equal. You have heightened developed three-year-olds, you have underdeveloped six-year-olds, and there's a massive spread across the board that pretty much means that you will just have to give medication based on the recommendations and look for 
physiological changes and adverse effects to better educate yourself on the next dose. So I'm sorry, there's no real easy way to do it with peds uh, because of these factors. Now the elderly, metabolism is also affected, okay, but it's never heightened. So because of reduction in liver size, reduction in blood flow, and overall hepatic metabolism rate because of the reduction in enzyme activity within the liver itself, it means that elderly are subject to a very long half-life. The metabolism of the drug is much, much harder. Now when you couple this reduction mostly in metabolism with excretion difficulties, then you are mixed with a huge increased chance of adverse effects and toxicity with the two classes of elderly or pediatrics. So your glomerulus filtration rate is often measured, it's measured by checking your creatine clearance. So checking your creatine levels, finding out what the percentage is, and then using it as a gauge of normal, slow, or, or increase. Now, infants under the age of one have a very low glomerulus filtration rate. So any drug that is given to a child that is excreted by the kidneys under the age of one is going to stick around the body longer and have a prolonged effect, so a longer half-life. Now when you get to the age of 40, on average, your function decreases by 1% every year. So every year over 40, your function, just by age itself, no other factors whatsoever, by age itself, decreases 1% every year. This is just purely because you're getting older. So the older you get over 40, the less glomerulus filtration rate you're going to have uh, as in regards to excretion. Now on top of that, because of the lack of blood flow and the size of the liver, you'll have a 50% reduction in blood flow to the liver. So any drug that is excreted completely by metabolism in the liver is also affected. Now pharmacodynamics in these two classes, the elderly and the pediatrics, is also something that needs to be taken into account. So when we look at the elderly and what the drug is going to do to the body, we need to understand that there's a significant reduction in the amount of receptor sites that are available for that drug. As you get older, things start to break down. And that includes receptor sites and coenzyme activity. So once that occurs, the metabolism and everything that we just talked about in pharmacokinetics has a massive play on the pharmacodynamics for the elderly patient. The reduced number of receptor sites means that a drug will generally stay around the body longer, partially activating different receptor sites, increasing the likelihood of adverse effects. So because of these physiological changes, they are more at risk of adverse effects. When you couple that with age-related disease and generally comorbidities as well, then you have an increased risk for competitive drugs for receptor sites that are either affected by a pathological process or a existing disease as well. So the rule of thumb when dealing with the elderly is always best to start with a low dose, lower than therapeutic range dose, what would be considered therapeutic range, and then gradually increase or adjust from there, either up or down. Certain drugs, you may find that you need what is not even considered within the therapeutic index of adults to be effective on the elderly. Elderly get into a lot of trouble when they are given the adult recommended dose without any consideration of physiological changes. Now when we look at the pediatric side of the house, they're also subject to physiological changes. But in this case, it's because the receptor sites in their body isn't actually developed. So if you think of the, of the nervous system, for example, the pediatric side of the house will have a lot of unmyelinated neurons because it takes time over the years for these neurons to be myelinated. So that's a physiological difference. Now with that, you have a reduction in the receptor sites available within the neural system as well as with pretty much every other receptor site that is being developed as they grow. So like the elderly, the difference is the elderly have lost them through destruction and, and aging, the peds, they haven't developed them yet. Now peds are at risk of adverse effects because there isn't any robust, there's not a lot of, sorry, not a lot, there is some, but there's not a lot of robust studies 
with medications, especially the rarer medications for pediatrics, that says what adverse effects are likely to be found. So you give them medication, and if they're not properly monitored afterwards, they could have adverse effects and have profound adverse effects because of the associated uh, changes within the pharmacokinetics. So when we're dealing with pediatric, it is often done by uh, weight or body surface area, length even. Um, that's how d doses are done. What we need to take into account is we never increase the dose beyond an adult dose, and we always adjust it based on clinical effects. Because again, we're not really sure what's gonna happen within pharmacodynamics, and there's a lot of variables associated with pharmacokinetics that are going to alter the way the drug is affected. So even in the case of the water-soluble ones, where we looked at amoxicillin, we mentioned before, 25 to 50 milligrams, if there's a child that is large enough that that dose would exceed one gram, then you give the one gram adult dose. That is it. Now, medication errors that happen with pediatrics. It's not hard to think about that the most common one that happens is an incorrect dose. So incorrect doses in pediatrics happen all the time because they consider pediatrics uh, because they're larger. So they go, oh, yeah, but you can get a larger dose. Or they don't know the difference between pediatrics and adults, so they give them one tablet or half a tablet without actually fully looking into it. But incorrect doses happen all, uh, to a similar rate that you'll find in, in adults. So medication errors aren't heightened in pediatrics. Most people that work in pediatrics are acutely aware of the effects, but an incorrect dose given or a medication error given to a child compared to an adult is three times more likely to cause harm. Give an incorrect dose to an adult and it's not always likely that adverse effects will occur for a lot of medications. But in pediatrics, it's three times more likely. So ways to fix it. If you're not used to working with pediatrics, which a lot of us aren't, then you need to be very, very careful and absolutely very specific in the way that you give medications. So when you're looking up the drug, only use the pediatric references. That's it. Only use them for the doses. Don't look at an adult one and consider it the same if it's, if it's weight-based. Um, you always have to look at the pediatric references. You need to get an accurate weight, weight and an accurate body surface area. In emergency departments, in children's wards or any ward, it is standard practice to weigh a child or do a body surface area calculation, both or one, whenever they walk into an emergency department or are admitted to a ward. So if you are working in one of these wards and it hasn't been done before giving any medication, you don't just ask the parents how much does your child weigh, you weigh them, you get an accurate rate, and you go from there. When you're doing maths, you do it very carefully, very, very carefully. You use a calculator, even if you think you're good at maths, you use a calculator and you get a second person to independently check it. Another standard practice when working with pediatrics is every single drug has to be double checked. Okay, that is a standard practice when working with pediatrics. We need to check the drug. Okay, you need to check what strength that particular medication is per mil, because a lot of these things are given in liquid-based form. These children have trouble swallowing tablets. If we are giving liquid-based substances, then you use an oral syringe, which is generally orange, and you use a calibrated spoon. Gone are the days where you give a teaspoon or a tablespoon of medication. It's a calibrated spoon for mills, and you use these proper tools to prevent overdosing. If you're dealing with older children, don't just assume that they're good at swallowing tablets. They've probably never swallowed tablets before in their life. They've always stuck to oral, so don't just rock up with a bunch of tablets and expect them to know what to do. Ask them, and then watch how effective they are at actually taking those tablets. But whenever you're working with pediatrics, just realize they're not small adults, they're very different, and you need to be absolutely spot on with the medications that you give. So before you give the medication to a ped, we need to do a, a clinical decision and a clinical assessment process where we assess 
everything about that child. We look at them, accurate race, body surface area, and length if you need to, and you look at doses. Now your pediatric reference will mention if it's based on weight or if it's based on body surface area, and it will also be written if the dose that you need is for a stat dose or a dose over 24 hours, so you need to be very clear in what you're looking at. So make sure you understand the dose. Make sure you ask the family what other medications the child's been on at home. A lot of families will like to medicate their own children. Now this includes over-the-counter or alternative therapies. Always ask what the child's been medicated with. Ask family history, okay, and then look at allergies. Allergies in children, especially children these days, are far more likely than adults or the elderly. When you're looking at the planning process, it needs to be age appropriate. So you can't go to a three-year-old and explain the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics at a cellular level. You need to be age appropriate and you need to provide written information if the carers are going away. A lot of the time parents will be with the child and they'll be too focused on the child to listen to great details of medication administration, especially if they're going away. So always provide written information for the carer and then if the child is old enough to comprehend language, provide education to the child as well. Just make sure it's age appropriate. When you're implementing it for the first time, make sure that the child understands. Allow time for the child to understand and the carers or the parents to understand and use appropriate tools. Now I am not going to claim that I am good at this at all. I am completely under practice. But my wife is incredible at this. She seems to have an inbuilt knack to make children take medication. It's often called upon at work as the nurse that makes children take their medication. Now what she tells me, that I don't quite understand, is she makes a relationship with the child and makes it fun, turns it into a game. Okay, now children development is obviously very different. They're extremely limbic based. They don't have a frontal lobe, so analysis and reason doesn't work. You can't say, it's good for you, it will make you feel better, okay, even though you think that should work. Uh, you need to make it into a challenge or a game and use coercion a lot of the time in order to help the child understand the importance of taking medication. Now, after all is said and done and you evaluate, uh, you need to evaluate if your methods worked, and if it didn't, try to find a different way, different tablet, different method, whatever it is, but then also look at the effectiveness of the drug and watch for adverse effects and drug interaction. So remember, not a lot of studies out there that would tell us the probability of adverse effects. We don't really know how the drug is gonna interact in a, ch in a child. Obviously, we're going to look at interactions, and if it's contraindicated for adults, it's not going to be done, but we're not really 100% on drug interaction, and the effectiveness will determine whether or not we give more, increase the next dose, decrease the next dose, things like that. So that is the principles of pediatric administration. Now, dealing with the elderly. Now, medicine is getting really good. It's like most Western population, uh, we're moving on to a very uh, aging population. So last statistic I read a little while ago said that about 12.5% around of the population were actually considered elderly, which is pretty pretty damn impressive when you think about it, because you know, all the ages you can have, 12.5% um, you know, of it was, actually I think it was a little bit more than that. It was 17.5% was, was uh, aging population. So with that, the older you get, the more age you are, the more comorbidities and age-related diseases and problems you're going to have. On top of that, there's a massive uh, problem with different sorts of drug adherence. Now, adults are pretty poor with drug adherence because they prioritize their busy, busy life over taking medication. And they don't set reminders under the influence that they're going to say, oh, I'll, I'll remember to take it. So they don't use anything to actually help them remember to take the medication. But when we're dealing with the elderly, it's a little bit different. So they're more subject to you know, quantified memory problems. Uh, so they, they, cannot, they just forget to take the drug. Okay, now if you add in actual diseases on top of that, Alzheimer's, dementia, then they can not only forget to take the drug, 
They can forget that they were ever prescribed that drug and they can actually start seeking medication for a previous drug they were once on. Now, on top of that, they're often isolated and left alone. A lot of their family has moved away, their loved ones have passed on, so they're, they're quite isolated without a lot of people to help them and remind them of things. Now, their communication with their loved ones is difficult and they're quite stoic as well, so they don't like, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them don't like to bring other people into their problems, okay? It's about a part of the generational gap. They, they, they had it. They had it pretty tough, and they had to be self-reliant as well. Now, polypharmacy is something that's highly associated with the elderly, but believe it or not, it's actually quite common with the pediatrics as well. Not because of they're on so many medications, but people will often just give children adult-based doses, especially with over-the-counter or alternative medication. They'll just give the same dose, thinking that what possible harm could alternative or over-the-counter medication do without understanding. So polypharmacy is not just a problem for the elderly, it's just a, a different one. Now with the drug adherence and polypharmacy, what you'll find is the elderly will often take medication without understanding why they're taking it. So we say, oh, this drug, why are you taking this drug? And they go, I don't know, the doctor told me. Now, the elderly have a lot more faith in doctors. Okay, doctors used to be considered on, on massive pedestals within the community, free haircuts, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas now they're, they're more like an insurance claim waiting to happen, unfortunately. But the elderly have a lot of faith in medical professionals. So if they say to take a medication, then they'll just take it. No questions asked, forget about what it was actually for, and they'll just take it. Now with that, if they see a new physician, which often they do, they'll get in when they can, cheapest place, availability, that sort of thing, and they're not able to articulate the reasons why they're taking it, which is, means that when they get new medications, there's often a duplication that, that occurs. Okay, Very often a duplication, because medication wasn't handed over, not all medications are tracked by every pharmacy, so they will take it. So they'll get duplications, they'll get drugs that are contraindicated with one another, and because of this, and because of all the problems that we've spoken about, they often get drugs for the side effect that is caused by the drugs that they're taking. So they'll take a drug, it causes constipation, and they'll take laxatives, which just increases the the pharmacokinetic problems as well and the absorption rate of all the other drugs that they're taking and if they weren't taking the original drug that they probably didn't need they wouldn't have the side effect and they wouldn't need to take the secondary drug and so on and so forth so when it comes to how we fit in with the elderly when you're treating the elderly and you see this bag or box or anything that's in that they bring in and say this is what I'm taking best thing you can do is provide awareness and information on the medication. Make them active in understanding of what the medication is. Now it may be difficult, they may not want to know at all, they just go, oh I'll, I'll trust you dear, just tell me what to take. But having their understanding is always going to mean for a lot more likelihood that they're not going to take another drug on top. Okay, that's that's the goal. Now I'm not saying it's an easy goal by any stretch of the imagination. We've all worked with elderly, elderly and seen the medications that they bring in, especially if you work with the ambulance department. You're like, I've taken all of these. You're like, okay, let me get my list. But it's still just because it's difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't we shouldn't try. Now, when administering drugs to the elderly which you'll often do on wards, things like that. You need to assess the elderly. You need to look at how much fat to muscle ratio they have and their skin condition, if it's topical. Have a look at their medical history and as, as well have a look at their medication history. So what drugs do they take that they're prescribed? What do they take themselves? And what alternative therapies do they do? Now, uh, elderly are very, very helpful with one another. So. A lot of the times they actually hoard medication, they don't have a lot of stable finances or access to uh, get to pharmaceuticals, it's actually a bit of an effort for them to get to the pharmacy to get the drugs, 
So with that, they often they like to share medication. Oh, I've ran out of arthritis medication, and then their friend goes, "Oh well, I have arthritis. I take this for it," and in absolute beautiful good nature, hand over the arthritis medication, not realizing that it can be absolutely detrimental. So you need to have a look at medications that they've been taking fully and provide education on why medications differ and not to share them and try to stop from hoarding medications. So in the event that they're looking for something similar, looking for a, a symptom relief or they've forgotten what their effects were and they remember an old condition that they had, they will seek these medications. So when trying to increase adherence for, for clients that are leaving, especially moving out of the hospital, try to get them to use reminder aids. Now, there are lots and lots of aids out there that you can use uh, to help you. There's obviously pill charts, there's Webster packs that a lot of them get. They'll get the, the dose calendar, a dose clock. If they're up to date with technology, you can have apps on your phone that will give you a reminder and tell you exactly what drugs to take and when. So just talk to them, see what they're comfortable to use, see what's in their life already, and then go from there. Also encourage them to write up a medication list or get a loved one or family to write up a medication list of what they take and why so they can provide it to any other healthcare professionals. When you are administering it yourself and you're in the hospitals, get the person to sit up. They may be comfortable lying down, but remember the increased risk of choking due to swallowing difficulties, so get them to sit up, take medications one at a time, don't just give them a fistful to take all five at once, and have it go with water. For you, if a medication's not supposed to be crushed, then don't crush it. Okay, we've been to a lot of workplaces where you've seen delayed release or enteric, enteric coated medications being crushed because it's easier for barrel to handle if it's crushed and mixed with some form of food. The same thing when you are um, evaluating, look for the therapeutic effects. Watch out for the adverse effects and interactions and don't fall into the habit of just saying or passing off adverse effects as, oh, it's just because you're old. Okay, that's why you've got that problem is because you're old. That is the easy answer. Okay, and just because it may be true, doesn't mean you should fall into the trap in saying that everything that goes wrong with the elderly is a direct relation to them being old. Okay, we'll just talk quickly before we finish up on pregnancy. Now, pregnancy is a is adult, hopefully, um, patients, but they have a developing fetus within their bodies. Now, there are classes of drugs that cause um, mutations with it. Okay, so. Tetragenesy is a term that is used that causes a morphological defects of the actual fetus during development. Now, it is a huge risk, okay, so your tetragenic class drugs are extremely toxic to fetal development. Now, a baby is most susceptible to these problems when it will in, in their first trimester. So for those that don't know and don't remember trimesters, um, first 13 weeks represents the first trimester. Now, you may have friends or you yourself may remember when you found out that you were pregnant. Some people don't find out that they're pregnant until 12 weeks, eight weeks, okay, within their trimester. So if you are administering medication to a female that could be pregnant, okay, especially if you're giving a class of drug that is tetragenic, you need to check for pregnancy. Okay, you need to do a pregnancy test in order to determine whether or not they are pregnant themselves. Now, because of the lack of studies associated with pregnancy as well, for similar reasons to pediatrics, no one wants to harm a fetus in utero, which is, you know, that's a fair reason not to pass the ethics board. So because of that, we have classes of drugs that uh, sit in different categories within the, pe the pregnancy side of the house. So just to let you know, any category A drug uh, 
has a drug that's been taken many times by lots of pregnant people and nothing has gone wrong. So there's, there's no proven fetal damage whatsoever to them. So paracetamol, penicillin, classic ones, no problems whatsoever. When we move into category B, it gets quite difficult because it's got to do with there's, there's no proven um, increased occurrence of fetal damage or, or harm. But there's not a lot of people that are taking it. Okay, so B, because there's not a huge amount of people taking these particular drug, they don't have a good capture to one other who as definitively say that it's a category A. Now with that, we have categories B1, B2, and B3. Now this has got to do with animal studies themselves. So B1 is there is animal studies that haven't produced evidence of increased fetal harm. So that's B1. There's no human, but there's animal. B2 is animal studies with pretty weak evidence that it's not going to do any harm. Category B3 is there's animal studies that shows evidence, but there's no evidence that it's humans. Now, obviously, there's difference between pharmacokinetics and dynamics with elderly, pediatrics, and adults. So there's definitely pharmacokinetic differences between humans and other animals as well. Okay, so that's your class B. Now a lot of them you'll, um, you'll see. It's just a matter of looking up the category. And then the way class category B are often administered is weigh up the benefit of the mother versus the potential of fetal development with a child. So if it very little benefit for the mother and it's a class B3, so then it's probably not going to be administered, at least not in the first trimester. They, they usually wait till later. When you get to category C, then you have, you got proof that the drug has or can, or, or you know, it's been linked to causing fetal harm or malformation of the, of the child. Okay, so there's actually some form of link or suspected link with that drug and fetal. Okay, so a lot of antipsychotics fit into class C. Category uh, D is drugs that they also suspect or prove, but it just has a higher occurrence. So it's more likelihood of causing harm. And category X is those ones that are, is as a quantified risk. Absolute high risk, irreversible damage to the child. You know, don't, don't take them, basically. Okay, so that's your um, categories when you're dealing with pregnancy. Now, women that are lactating as well, you need to remember that drugs that are in the body, as they pass around, they bind to the proteins, and a lot of drugs will actually get mixed into the milk. So they'll get mixed into the lactation and then passed during breastfeeding uh, and can have secondary effects on the child. Okay, so if there's any um, nursing mothers, you need to be aware that any drugs you are giving the mother you need to take into account the effects that could happen on the child. And if there are quantified risks, then tell the mother not to breastfeed for the recommended period of time. Uh, now, these are often associated with certain classes of antibiotics, okay, just to be careful. So post-pregnancy um, or post-delivery infections, you're given an antibiotic, often will result in the mother not being able to breastfeed from there. Okay, so that is medication across the lifespan. I hope you got something out of it. Obviously, you can make careers in each one of these areas, pediatrics, geriatrics, that side of the house. This is more of an introduction of a general responsibility that you have within the healthcare professional uh, to look after these, these quite needy and well-deserving classes of people. Uh, until next time, take care.